Good evening, everyone. Please remain standing. I wish to inform Council of the passing of former Councillor Keith Smiles, who was a councillor for Cullercoats Ward from 1995 to 1999. Can I ask everyone to please observe a minute's silence? Thank you. Please. <laughs> Item number one. <coughs> Is Mr. Turner in attendance? Thank you. Count we will now take the question as read. Councillor Johnson, would you like to respond, please? Thank you, Chair. Um, the Our North Tyneside plan sets out our bold and ambitious plans for making North Tyneside an even greater place to live, work and visit by 2025. As part of this plan, Walls End has been identified as a place for investment and as a result of a key component of our ambition in the Borough's regeneration strategy. To date, the Council has worked alongside partners to new facilities to bring vacant buildings back into use to increase, first of all, in the town centre. The Hadrian Health Centre has been developed alongside the NHS and is, or is now open. The Cusma First Centre, located on the High Street, provides a library facility, the Spirit of North Tyneside Wing and a home for voter. Private sector contributions delivered an Aldi Wells Spoon to Burger King. The conversion of 11 derelict properties on Solid Street into new homes. Tedco now occupies space at Warsaw Town Hall and provides a drop-in venue for startup business and social enterprise looking for guidance. In addition, the council organised a number of exciting events to drive footfall to town to increase dwell times and attract new and repeat visitors. In 2022, Walls and Cusma First Centre holds the, pre the world premiere of Peter Rabbit's Story Time Trail, which ran for five weeks and attracted nearly 4,000 visitors. Families frocked to the Under the Stars event in Richard Dees Park in February to see the beautiful fire installation, the vector of soundtrack, and the appearance of a larger than life mythical being made of stars. In June, Walls End was chosen to host the Beacon Lighting Ceremony to mark the Queen's Platinum Jubilee, attracting a large crowd. A visit from Raymond's Biggs fell at Christmas to the Forum in December, kicked up the festive season, which also saw Christmas lights along High Street. And new technology has been embraced to encourage people to explore the town, its attractions. The Romans Augmented Reality Trail app, which was launched at the end of 22, has been used by the Fire and Time Center, with plans to expand the concept further in 2023. This is in addition to program events organised by the Council's Skills and Employability team to support people back into work and a program of adult community learning to help improve digital and language skills. The Council have placed footfall monitors in various locations in the town to monitor footfall and patterns as well as monitoring vacancies within the town for retail premises too. Positively, the vacancy rate is well below the natural average of 40% and operates at a healthy 11%. In line with the policy objectives for the town, the council has been successful in securing 1.94 million of funding from the North Tank Combined Authority, a robust work programme that includes a key objective to maintain and increase footfall, visit numbers, spend, and that can see in town centres and high streets. The work package is currently in development, set to launch before spring, and includes a dedicated and support business support resource for startup SMEs, including free incubator programmes and the point of the business liaison officer. A shop print improvement scheme for a total of 100k in grants for businesses to improve the external facades of their property. 
animation program that builds on the successful events, particularly the Augmented Reality Trail, that brings Segedunum into the town centre. Strengthening the connectivity between Segedunum and the town centre and creating an improved route which will enable those to use Hadrian's Wall cycle route to access the rest of the town's assets to increase footfall, including animated trails. As a result, the Project High Street, the High Street Partnership Board includes representatives from local businesses and the council has been established. Provides a forum for key stakeholders of the town to get together to ensure interventions are contributing to the objectives of the project. Increased footfall being a key one. In addition, the government's High Street Task Force provides advice and support to build capacity as the businesses become more involved in the town. Building a success of the work and well hub in North Shields, the council is also planning to install one in Wars End, which will generate footfall. Work continues in preparing the Wars End Master Plan, which was approved by Cabinet in November 22, and we should be subject to public engagement in January and February 23. This looks at improvements to the town in terms of the roads and footpaths on High Street East and West and Station Road, improvements to the Sega Dunham Museum, increased cycling provision, business support, events and further partnership working with the owners of the former shopping centre to support further investment from them. All contributing to the efforts to help improve the environment for the visitors and residents coming and enjoy the town. Sadly, we also had to submit the Level Up Fund application in June 2022 for £20 million worth of much needed funds for Wall's End. Sadly, the Conservative Government chose to give this money to Leafy Richmond and Richie Sumac's constituency instead of the much needed work in Wall's End, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Johnson. Question two. Is Mr Thorne in attendance? No. We'll take the question as read. Councillor Graham, would you respond, please? Thank you very much, Chair. We take the management of our highway network very seriously, and road safety is a vital part of this. Each year we undertake a substantial programme of maintenance and management works on the highway network, including extensive vegetation management work. As part of this, the authorities' highway inspectors undertake regular inspections of all streets across the borough, which include road signs. Where vegetation cutbacks are identified, they will be added to our works programme. Landowners are also notified of their obligations to cut back foliage where appropriate. We also undertake routine management works on our highway network, such as gully cleansing, litter removal, sweeping and vegetation clearance. This includes, for example, the A1058 Coast Road and the A188189 Salters Lane Corridor, where management works are carried out twice a year. One-off works such as thorough vegetation cutbacks are also undertaken as and when required. Our vegetation management programme includes works in the vicinity of highway junctions to maintain visibility and to support road safety. We will continue to work to ensure that our highways are managed and maintained to support road safety and for the benefit of residents and visitors. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Gray. Question three, is Mr Cadman in attendance? No, we'll take that as read. Councillor Graham, you want to respond to this one as well, please? Thank you, Mr Cadman, for your question. Whilst there isn't a regional action plan to assess and remove ash trees, I would like to explain our planned approach within North Tyneside. Our inspection regime takes place between April and September, when the trees are in leaf. The first phase of ash tree inspections began in July 2022, where we assessed the severity of disease in each tree following nationally recognised guidance, which categorised the trees into bands one to four. Any tree that was categorised as either three or four has been identified for removal. I'm pleased to report that the work fell to fell ash trees identified in phase one of the inspection programme began in October last year and will be completed by the end of March this year. The inspection of ash trees will continue to take place annually and will commence again in April this year. And any further trees identified for removal will be added to the work programme. With regards to tree planting, I can confirm that the list of locations has been agreed for this current season, where a further 280 trees will be planted. Planting of these trees commenced in November 22 and will be completed by the end of March this year and includes replacements in some residential streets where residents have asked for them to be replaced. As part of our ongoing commitment to annual tree planting, Members of the public can suggest new locations which will be considered in line with our strategy. I hope this demonstrates the Council's commitment to the management of trees across the borough and thank you once again 
for your question. Thank you, Councillor Graham. Qu question four, is Mrs Harrison in attendance? <coughs> no? We take the question as read. Councillor Graham, I believe you're answering this one as well. I am indeed. Thank you, Chair. The Council's Transport Strategy and Highway As Asset Management Plan aims to have a well-maintained highway network for the enjoyment of all highway users, including members of the public who may have mobility issues. As such, we allocate funding every year for a rolling programme of work to install dropped kerbs at junctions and other key locations in order to make routes more viable for mobility scooters. The Council's Highways team have made an assessment of the dropped kerb requirements at Beechcroft Avenue and Beach Road on the route to Morrison's pedestrian crossing. And I'm pleased to confirm to you today, Mrs. Harrison, that the improvements will be included in the next phase of dropped curb work, which will commence it later this year. Thank you, Chair. Question five. Is Mr. Cummings in attendance? No? We'll take that one as read as well, and I believe it's you again, Councillor Graham. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for your question, Mr Cummings. I can confirm that the authority does have a statutory obligation to remove graffiti. To help us meet these obligations, we have a set of environmental maintenance standards in place, which includes graffiti removal. These standards are published on the Council's website. I'm pleased to confirm that the authority does have response targets in place. For example, we aim to respond to any reports of graffiti within three working days. However, for reports of offensive graffiti, the response target is much quicker where we aim to remove graffiti within an hour of receiving a report. The majority of the graffiti reports removed, received are removed by our dedicated graffiti removal team. However, on some occasions, external specialist removal is required to avoid causing damage to property, structures and road signs. We manage performance against our graffiti removal targets internally and report our performance to the Association of Public Service Excellence. I hope the information I've provided provides reassurance of the Council's commitment and approach to the removal of graffiti from across the borough to ensure that North Tyneside remains a great place to live, to work and to visit. And thank you once again for your question. Thank you, Councillor Graham. Question six, is Mr Steele in attendance? Mr Steele, would you like to ask your question or have it taken as read? No, I'll, I'll ask if you don't mind. Um, thanks very much for allowing me to ask questions of our elected representatives. Um, I read with interest the uh, Council's claim to cut carbon by 53% and being ahead of schedule for its 100% target in 2030, although I did note that 2% of the borough's emissions are due to the Council and the rest is general borough um, emissions. Um, I was wondering if you can report on uh, carbon emissions uh, cuts from 2019, um, when the climate emergency was declared, as the figures that were released, I think, were derived from a baseline set in 2010. Councillor Graham, would you respond, please? Thank you, Chair. Again. Thank you for your question. Rep responding to the climate emergency is the top policy priority for this Council, and I'm very proud of the work we are doing. The statements we make about our action to tackle the climate emergency, rather than claims, are measured impacts in line with national and international methods, such as the Greenhouse Gas Reporting Protocol, and I am confident in our numbers. When a climate emergency was declared at full council in July 2019, the council's carbon footprint was already down by 45%. The declaration of a climate emergency was not the start of our ambitious programme of work and we had already made significant achievements. The Council's most recently reported carbon footprint for the year 2021-22 is 53% down and we are projecting a further reduction to 55% at the end of this financial year. Over the next 12 to 18 months, we will see further significant reductions 
as we convert more streetlights to LED, enjoy full year benefits of our solar PV scheme at Killingworth Depot, and our air source heat pumps go live at our four leisure centres. An annual data set is provided to the authority by central government detailing the carbon footprint of the borough. This is usually 18 months after the end of the reporting period. At the time of declaring the climate emergency in 2019, borough ride carbon emissions had decreased by 39% in real terms and by 42% per head of population. The most recent data set available for, to us for the calendar year 2020 and shows that the carbon footprint of the borough has decreased by 47% in real terms and by 51% per head of population. The Council publishes an annual performance report on its website that details the year-on-year -year measurement of the authorities and the borough's respective carbon footprints. You can also find our Carbon Net Zero 2030 action plan on the website. And thank you once again for your question. Thank you, Councillor Graham. Mr Steele, would you like to ask a supplementary question? It must, if you do, it must be related to the first question you asked. Of course, yeah. yeah uh, thanks for that, and thanks for your response, uh, Sandra. Um, you know, I think that the remarkable achievement of 53% over the years is, is, is to be admired. Um, but as, as with a lot of these initiatives, I think um, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit to be had, easy, easy to attain targets. And a, an example of that would be um, the, the national grids has cleaned Mr. up. Mr Steele, th yeah. there needs to be a question there very quickly. <laughs> yeah, uh, Chair, I believe I've got a minute to ask my question. It, and it's, it's quite daunting, being up here and getting interrupted doesn't, doesn't help me much. Um, so please just let me put a bit of context to this. Um, so I've lost my train. Um, yeah, you, you know, with the national grid um, get reducing air cleaning up by about 51% over the last nine years. And I just wonder, you know, you said about targets regarding air source heat pumps in, is it, <coughs> excuse me, one leisure centre, I'm not, I'm not sure. I just wonder about uh, what other targets you have and the challenges you see to get that ambitious target to 2030. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Graham, would you respond, please? Well, we have a climate emergency board, both internally to the council and externally. We have a, we have a climate emergency board. Uh, we have 158 actions on our carbon 2030 action plan. So I think if you had a good look at that, Mr Steele, you'll find there's a huge ambitious target that this authority has on every front. There's nothing that we do in this local authority that doesn't involve climate change. It's at the back of our minds at every juncture, at every decision that we make, we, we consider climate change. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Graham. Question seven, is Mrs Remfrey in attendance? No. In that case, we'll take the question, question as read. Councillor Johnson, would you respond, please? Thank you, Chair. Um, the authority has considered the option of seeking an arrangement of a car club in relation to staff travel. We firstly support our employees to travel to work by walking, cycling, public transport, in accordance with the approach taken on the North Tyneside Transport Strategy and wider North East Transport Plan. We have a number of initiatives in place to make it easier and more affordable for employees to use more sustainable modes of transport for their journey to work and as part of work. These include a cycle to work, salary sacrifice scheme, options for employees to purchase public transport season tickets, car sharing for the journey to work as a further option to reduce costs and carbon emissions, and many of our employees can take part in this through the Cobalt Park car sharing scheme. When our employees need to travel as part of their work, they do. We are increasingly converting our fleet use to electric vehicles, and there are also pool vehicle arrangements in place to support the operational requirements of service areas within the authority and its partners. In addition, our employee team have access to a car leasing via a salary sacrifice arrangement, helps employees obtain more modern vehicles, which are likely to be lower emissions than older cars. As part of our Carbon Net 30 20 zero Action Plan, we'll be looking at options to increase the take of our zero emission vehicles through the scheme. We also um, right here in the Cobol, have two car club providers in operation and right around the borough. Um, both Co Wheels and Enterprise have car club operations that any member, not just member of North Tyneside staff, but any member of the public can sign up to and we would encourage them to do so. 
Um, the measures which we've discussed will be co complement the wider measures set out in our carbon and zero action plan, deliver a carbon reduction and support low air, improved local air quality in the borough. Thank you, Councillor Johnson. That's the end of the questions. I'm sure that you would all wish to join me in congratulating our elected mayor, who was officially recognised as part of this year's New Year's Honours List for her work in political and public service. This is a fantastic accolade, Dame Norma Redfern, and one that you should be truly proud of. It is a true reflection on your dedicated commitment to the people of our borough and many years of incredible public service. Can I invite members the opportunity to pass on their congratulations and to recognise this accolade before I move on? Would anyone like to say anything? No? Then I will ask. Do, is it the normal or the elected mayor to respond? Um, thank you very much. I'm just taking unawares there. But I just want to make sure this isn't just about me. This is about this amazing council that I am the elected mayor. Everyone out there who supports me and my colleagues, the amazing staff we have here, who actually many, many of them go way beyond their line of duty, to be quite honest. To the businesses that have supported me, to the uh, community uh, projects that have come together and worked with me. And I have to say, at the, at the end of the day, no one does anything wonderful on their own. It's about the amazing teamwork that we have developed across this borough. And thank you to all the residents, all the residents who have sent in lots of emails, cards, letters, uh, and to the business as well. Um, much appreciated. Thank you so much indeed. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. <laughs> Item two, I have received apologies from councillors Jay Harrison, Janet Hunter, Muriel Green and Paul Richardson. Are there any other apologies for absence? Right, item three, declarations of interest. Can I remind members if they have any registrable and or non-registrable interests in matter appearing on the agenda and the nature of the interest, they must verbally declare in respect of any items of business to be discussed at this meeting and the nature of such interests. You are also invited to disclose any dispensation from the requirement to declare any registrable and or non-registrable interests that have been granted to you in respect of any matters appearing on the agenda. Those members should also complete the card on your desk and return it to the receptacle located on the desk of the Democratic Services Officer before leaving. Item four. They don't appear to any declarations of interest. Item four. The next item is minutes of the council meeting held on the 24th of November 2022. Can I ask the council to confirm those minutes, please? Yes. Thank you. Item five. The next item is motions. Motion number one. Can I invite Councillor Bartoli to move the motion, please? Thank you, Chair. Tonight's meeting is being recorded. The public have spoken, councillors have and will have their views and decisions uh, made, and this meeting will then be posted on YouTube for all of our residents to view. This is honest, open and transparent governance, and we can all be held to account for what we actually say and how we actually vote, rather than any political spin or cleverly worded Facebook posts. The motion I'm proposing tonight simply extends this practice of recording and publishing meetings to those held by the Cabinet, the Council, committees and subcommittees, and making these available online for our residents to view. As councillors, we attend regular meetings that are supposedly open to the public, but do not see attendees. 
as they're often during the working day, require a knowledge of the structure and process of the council and its website, or require transport to and from the council offices. One of the biggest criticisms we all hear, I'm sure, as councillors, is that the council can appear opaque and decisions are often made behind closed doors. If this motion passes tonight, it will throw open our doors for all of our residents to see and expose both the good and bad of our decision-making processes. These other meetings where planning decisions are made or the budget is scrutinised or our schools, housing or environment are discussed, these meetings are the real decision-making forums of the Council and the meetings that most affect our individual residents. We certainly have the equipment, we have the skills and the resources to do this and the real question tonight is do we have the bravery to open ourselves up to the very people we are meant to represent. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Bartoli. Do you have a seconder for this motion? Thank you, Chair. Councillor Bones. Um, I'm happy to second this motion in the interest of openness and transparency in local government. The Nolan principles say that holders of public office should act and take decisions in an open and transparent manner. Information should not be withheld from the public unless there are, unless there are clear and lawful reasons for so doing. The recording of council meetings has been transformational for the level of political debate within North Tyneside. This motion seeks to go further, opening up committees and crucially cabinet to full view of the public. Consider the committees that are held during the working day, inaccessible to most of the working population of our borough. This proposal would open meetings up to them. Or consider the, those with transportation or accessibility difficulties who may struggle to get here in person to watch proceedings. This proposal would open meetings up to them too. Regarding the legal implications circulated, we agree that there would need to be protocols and safeguards in place in the same way that those exist for the recording of full council. The same applies to the points around recording members of the public. It happens at full council during public questions, as we've just seen, so I don't envisage it would be a problem with this motion. If this council is proud of the work that it does for its residents, and if it's confident that what goes on in committees will be looked on favourably by the public, then I see no reason that this whole council won't back this motion. After all, sunlight is the best disinfectant. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Bones. And now I'm back, Councillor Johnson. Chair, I have notified Democratic Services an amendment. The amendment is there. Chair, I can talk from amendment while members are reading if you wish. Um, so that would be helpful. We on this side would always welcome this, but what we were not going to do was the cost would be hugely significant if we were to get our member of staff who records the meetings to come to every council committee and cabinet meeting and to record them. But we did make investment in recently and you will see around the room there is new cameras fitted all around this room that will allow from May 2023 for these meetings to be recorded. Every meeting that takes place in this chamber will be able to be recorded. Um, and we think it's absolutely right that that does take place. Um, but we also want some advice because we know how this potentially could be politically used as well. We also want the legal advice from the monitor to advise of any legal or standards issue which may arise from the sharing of clips or taking clips out of context while sharing them. So we, we absolutely want all means to be open, transparent, recorded and out there, but we just need a bit more advice and we don't want to unnecessarily waste council, off, council taxpayers' money by getting someone to stand record as being when we're already putting the technology in place to do so, Chair. Do you have a second for the amendment? <clears throat> Happy to second. I mean, uh, I don't think there's any disagreement across this chamber that transparency and uh, recording of meetings will be a good thing. Uh, the only difference is that we believe that we t out the technology is already in place to do that in moving forward. And uh, it's important that when meetings are, are broadcast, that um, the entirety of the meeting is broadcast so that uh, the public can see exactly what's happened and don't get to edited highlights. Um, which obviously can pre pre present a distorted view of what's happened, which has uh, happened in some of the unofficial recordings that have happened here recently. Thank you, Councillor Samuel. Would anyone speak to the, like to speak to the amendment, not the original one, the amendment? Chair, for the sake of brevity, um, we're willing to vote for the amendment on this side. You, you would accept the amendment? In that case, we'll, we'll vote on the amendment. All those in favour? Yes, we will vote. Thank you. We will vote on the amendment. All those in favour? 
That appears to be unanimous. Are there any abstentions? Right, I'll now invite members to... to motion, motion to... Motion to... Motion. I thought that was just a vote. I thought that was a vote on the amendment. Motion to... Vote hmm? motion to... Motion to... Councillor Thurloway, would you like to move the motion, please? Thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> It's not often that I'm lost for words, um, but what can you really say about the war in Ukraine? Where do you begin? Um, for me, I look around this room and I see democracy, I see people freely exchanging ideas and disagreeing with each other. While this chamber is far from the battlefields of Ukraine, what we are doing tonight here, what we take for granted, this is what the people in Ukraine are fighting for and they're paying with blood. For, Ukra for the Ukrainians, the alternative to fighting is tyranny and fascism. The people of Ukraine are determined to be, more, to be masters of their own destiny, and it's our responsibility to help them in any way we can. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Thurlow. Councillor Bell, Gary Bell, would you like to second this motion? Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. Second, I may as well speak now, because um, there's obviously be consensus over the... Uh, political divide. Um, I'd just like tonight, before we you know, we start the ding-dong battles, imagine us tonight in this chamber um, being told that we had a couple of hours to leave our homes, our families, our loved ones, and to go somewhere we don't know going to go to, to another country. Um, that's quite unbearable to think, you know, really, what do you take? Do you take a passport? Do you take your, your savings? Do you take your cat? Do you take your dog? You know? So these people are fleeing. Um, and then when the Russian army came, um, parts of the Russian army are mercenaries and they committed the most horrific war crimes. So firstly I would like to extend a very warm welcome to any of our Ukraine refugees who are watching tonight or in the new audience and who are currently living in the borough. The Johnson Premiership was highly criticised but on Ukraine he got it totally right. He led the West. and. Um, he deserves a lot of praise for that, really. And um, it was good to see the Right Honourable Ben Wallace, who has been a star of the Conservative Party through all the different Prime Ministers. He's held the line with Defence Secretary. He spoke to Dion uh, about what the, um, the next year is going to be, 2023, for the Ukrainian support. I think we're going to give them 12 tanks. We need to give them more tanks than that. The chieftains are sitting there. We also haven't got any engines in them, but uh, if we could give them 50 tanks, it would be nice. Um, the West let Ukraine down in 2014, for those who don't know the history of the Russians. Uh, there is Russian speakers in Ukraine, and enclaves, yeah. and the Russians did invade Crim in Crimea, or took over Crimea in 2014, and certain parts which part led to this, uh, this war. So hopefully one day our Ukrainian friends can go home to the whole of Ukraine, live in peace, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Bell. I'll now invite members to speak to the motion. <laughs> Councillor Wallace. Um, thank you, Chairman. Um, the Conservative uh, group is very pleased to support this motion, and I agree entirely with what the previous speakers have said. Um, the invasion a year ago was absolutely shocking, and I think we should be very proud of our government's response to that invasion. Um, acting so promptly last February to support Ukraine and indeed giving world leadership on this issue, acting very swiftly. We know that the Ukrainians' fight against Russia is in fact our fight too, because it is an attack upon democracy. If Ukraine is defeated, which country will be next? We know, we know from bitter experience that bullies never stop after they have defeated one. A bully always moves on to another target. So we have no hesitation in supporting this, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wallace. Would anyone else like to speak? No? We'll now go to the vote, then. Those in favour? That looks unanimous, but are there any abstentions? No? That can't be unanimous. Right, motion three. Can I invite Councillor Davis to move the motion, please? 
Thank you, Chair. In 1971, Margaret Thatcher withdrew Milk for Primary School children aged over seven. This act earned her the title of Thatcher the Milk Snatcher. She later blocked Ken Clark, the then Health Secretary in 1989, from taking milk for the, from the under fives. Apparently quoting, just to save four million, I did this 19 years ago and it caused a terrible row. According to the Joseph Rowntree Foundation, across the UK, around 4.3 million children live in poverty, but only 2.3 million qualify for free school meals. Around 40% of universal credit claimants with jobs don't qualify for free school meals. The Child Poverty Action Group estimate that one in three children living in poverty are missing out. There is extensive evidence that providing school meals to vulnerable children improves both health and learning outcomes. Providing a nutritious hot meal lunch results in long-lasting health outcomes through improved diet quality by reducing obesity rates. Free school meals also help children to learn by reducing children's absences from school due to illness and improving concentration and attainment while they're in school. A range of studies in the UK and worldwide demonstrate positive impacts on diet quality, food security, BMI and academic performance. Universal school free meal provision has also been shown to increase take-up of free school meals by those who are already eligible, suggesting that wider provision reduces stigma or other barriers to take-up. There, are some, there is also some evidence to suggest that expansion of free school meal provision in England would present a positive return on investment. A cost-benefit analysis commissioned by Impact on Urban Health estimates that by expanding the scheme to all children in households on universal credit would generate £1.38 in economic and social benefits for every pound invested. Due to the rising cost of living, families are having to make difficult choices between heating and eating. Providing meals at school is a direct and efficient benefit. Expanding it would ensure fewer children go hungry in this cost of living crisis. The funding going direct to support children has, a high, has high public support. A recent YouGov poll suggested 72% of the public would support increasing free school meal provision. An argument constantly made by the Conservatives is that the cost is, is the cost, but relative to what has been written off by the same government in respect to furlough fraud, PPE contracts and Liz Trust disastrous budget, school meal extension is like a drop in the ocean of, debt, of the debt caused by those in charge. Rishi Shunak's five promises made no mention of tackling inequality and reducing poverty. As Mrs Thatcher found out, trying to save money by depriving school children is not, a, is not good for society or your reputation. I call on all members of this chamber to support this motion. Thank you, Councillor Davis. Councillor Fox, do you wish to second this motion? Yes, please. I'll, um, I'll speak now, if that's okay. That's fine. I'd just like to add some um, uh, further information to support the motion. Um, according to, this is um, from a report called the School Food Review Working Group had published called Feed the, F Feed the Future um, with some stark um, facts and figures. In April 2022, 17% uh, of UK households with children were affected by food insecurity. Over 2.6 million children were living in these households. June 2022, 1.9 million, 22.5% of pupils were on means-tested free school meals, but 800,000 children below the poverty line still don't qualify. September 2022, levels of food insecurity among households with children rose to 26%. This represents a total of 4 million children. October 2022, Unprecedentedly high food and fuel bills driving inflation, which will force more families to choose between food and fuel in winter. Every child should be able to eat a healthy meal at school so they can always be ready to learn and achieve their potential. And to ensure all children have an equal opportunity to thrive and be healthy, I would like to second this motion. Thank you, Councillor Fox. I'll now invite members to speak to the motion. 
Councillor Clark. Thank you, Chair. Um, obviously, I think um, <clears throat> we do need to call on the government um, to implement free school meals as a universal thing for children in primary schools. The motion mentions our Equally Well strategy, which was um, introduced and agreed by the Health and Wellbeing Board in November 2021. And since that time, there's been a range of um, innovative practical support interventions to support our residents through the cost of living crisis and also aimed at tackling the socio-economic determinants of health inequalities. Obviously, access to healthy, nutritious food is a major factor in people's health and well-being. And um, I think also introducing it and making it available to all primary school children would go a long way in reducing the stigma that some children who are eligible for free school meals do actually feel. And we hear horror stories of children crying because they haven't got enough to eat. We hear stories of children being isolated and embarrassed to open the lunchbox because of what um, they've got in it and what their friends might see. So I think it would be a really great way of tackling this and I definitely support this motion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Clark. Before we move on, Councillor Fox, could you put your microphone off, please? Thank you. Councillor Bartoli. Thank you, Chair. I've often sat here being critical of motions that have clearly been sent from Labour HQ or cut and pasted from the internet, which are offered here without being properly read or researched. And clearly this is not one of those motions. And I can now see why Councillor Johnson seems to discourage the party opposite from presenting their own ideas. We know that in the past Councillor Davis has tried to unseat our elected mayor and this motion reads more like the, op the, op the opening salvos of a socialist utopia manifesto than it does anything aimed at actually solving a problem. This is just a scattergun approach to policy with no focus or thought. I don't intend to dissect the motion in detail, but simply reading the first few points. This proposes to give free breakfast and lunch to all primary school children without any means testing. This demonstrates the kind of socialist polit political naivety that would make even a Jeremy Corbyn supporter blush. What we all want to do on the left or the right is to help the poorest in society and provide them with security and opportunity. Councillor Davis wants to provide free school meals to the richest parents, those with children at Eton and Harrow, and pay from them from the taxes of the working class man and woman. I think when she read Robin Hood, she mistakenly thought the Sheriff of Nottingham was the hero, as this motion robs from the poor and seems to give to the rich. Now, whilst we can all commend Councillor Davis's enthusiasm and her colleagues and their aims, this motion fails to achieve any of them. I would suggest that they consider going back to the cut and paste motions of the past. Thank you, Councillor Bartoli. Councillor Thurlaway? Thank you, Chair. Um, I think it's quite ridiculous that Councillor Bartoli would even mention Robin Hood after Liz Trust tried to cut the taxes for the richest in society and she didn't even have a way to pay for it. And then she tanked the economy Everyone's mortgages are going up, cost of living's going up. You're just economically illiterate. You know, I, I thought we could meet, you know, we met halfway on Ukraine, but we can't meet on feeding children. It's, it's feeding children, it's, it's, it's pretty basic for a society. And it's not just about the richest children, it's about those people who fall through the cracks, who are in work poverty, who aren't on benefits, who aren't entitled to free school meals, but their parents still struggle to feed them. It is, it is as basic as that. And after what's happened in the last year, the idea that you can criticise this motion is just absolutely ridiculous. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Thurlaway. Would anyone else like to speak? Councillor Graham. Set against this is um, total reduction in the Bay Phone Bank's donations of food. So we've got people in our towns, in our villages, who have children going hungry. I don't know how you can look yourself in the mirror and say that we can't feed children. It is a disgrace. Thank you. Uh, Chair, Chair, just to address that point, what, I, what I'm suggesting is not that we don't feed children. What I'm suggesting is that this motion singularly fails to achieve that aim. Thank you. Sir? 
Oh, sorry, Councillor Chris Johnson, I beg your pardon. Two no seats. problem. Thank you, Chair. It's <laughs> thank you. Um, it's crazy. The, the the principle is obvious. The motion constructed like this is ridiculous. I used to teach GCS English. Writing to argue, persuade, and instruct was a simple element of that. This would never get the lowest pass grade. It needs restructuring before it's ever put up on that board, and then we understand what you mean. In fact, you're not doing that. You, you, I, I'd be embarrassed if this goes to the general public and they consider this standard of written English is acceptable to conservative group. It's as simple as that. If you construct your motions correctly, then we we'll, may well go along with them. But this is a mishmash. I let that go, Councillor Johnson, but it really wasn't appropriate. Councillor Bones? I think Councillor Bones in good. She can't. Councillor? Um, well, it's really quite a shame uh, for you to be opposing this motion because at the present moment, we are all, all, everyone, we have teachers on strike, nurses on strike, everyone is on strike. So there is no way you can say the feed are reaching, if the, the rich are feeding the poor, because almost 90% of the people are striking because of the cost of living standards. So that means every child in almost every household is actually suffering and sometimes people are shy to come out to say we need free meals and I really think you should think twice about supporting this motion because this motion is really quite important like for everyone as the cost of living is bad for almost the whole country as you can see on the picket lines. Thank you, Councillor Mazingu. Councillor Boehm? Thank you, Chair. Um, I think the point that Councillor Bartoli was making um, is a point that Councillor Clark picked up on her speech, is that this motion turns away from the idea of targeted welfare in its entirety. This motion stands up for the idea that everyone should receive the same level of support, no matter what their household income is, no matter what uh, their situation. And I think what that fails to understand, and the real failure for this motion, why I can't support it, Chair, is the idea that if there is a pot of a certain amount of money, that that pot should be spread equally rather than targeted towards the people who most need it. And for every school meal that is paid for, for someone at a private school or someone who didn't, doesn't need a free school meal under this motion, that is less funding for people who actually need welfare. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Bones. Councillor Newman? Thank you, Chair. I just want to say that the proposers should be commended for bringing this uh, motion. Let's look at the reality. The people who are using food banks aren't always people on benefits. The cost of living crisis is hitting everybody. And it's hitting people who are in full-time work. They're hitting families who have got both parents working. And the idea that you're going to pick small faults with the motion is, is, is something that I can't stomach. If you've got children at school, you'll know that at this moment in school, you'll have some parents who've got free school meals, some parents who pay for meals, some people who've got packed lunches. Sometimes economy of scale is just doing one system and makes it fair and makes it for everybody. And before we say that we can't do stuff like this, we don't target the NHS. It's free at the point of entry for everybody. We don't means test the fire brigade. I don't see a reason why we should means test food. Councillor Carl Johnson. Thank you, Chair. Um, it was breakfast clubs that got me first politically active in this borough um, in 2010. Um, now Mayor Redfern was leading a campaign on the reintroduction of breakfast clubs in North Tyneside. Um, many years earlier, Mayor Redfern had introduced them at her school in West Walker. Um, proven to be a great success, not just for the child's um, social and mental well-being, but physical well-being as well. It transformed that area and it transformed the progression of the child through school, their education, attainment, and their ability to be fed. Lots of the children would often, sadly, not have ate since the night before, or their school dinner the night before when they came in for their breakfast in the morning. 
Universal infant free school meals have made such a colossal difference in this borough and around the country in what they've achieved in education maintainment and in child's health and well-being. Extending this to all primary school children by many, many experts' um, view would transform the health and well-being of children in this country and put them on a much better step as they go in the high school. That's what we're asking for all primary school age children in this country to be given the opportunity to go to high school having been given every single opportunity they have in primary school. And we're also asking for a loophole to be closed. If you're on universal credit, you are often in work poverty. The majority, we've seen the levels of child poverty figures in this region. We have the highest levels of child poverty in this country. This motion would go a long way to try to tackle some of that. We've also seen the disgraceful situations around this country in a &E and in hospital trusts at the moment. Um, the Leader of Opposition led on this asked Prime Minister's questions yesterday. Um, sharing heart-wrenching stories of those people that have been left in trolleyways, left without ambulances, left without the elective surgeries to improve their health and well-being. This motion, Chair, if adopted, is not a ridiculous charade as suggested by the Conservative Party. It would generally try to improve the lives of residents of this borough and that's what we should all be here to do, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Johnson. Councillor Pickard? Uh, thank you, Chair. I just listened to the debate before from the Tories. It was like going back to 2008 and 2009 when they tried to justify not providing stuff for people on the basis that a millionaire may get, a millionaire's children may get some breakfast or may get a free school meal. But it's interesting that in this country, in England, you get the free school meals in the first two years at, at primary school. And then after that, it becomes a, a lottery on where, where you are. However, in Wales and in Scotland, they actually recognise the need for free school meals for all primary school children because of the educational increase in attainment that it actually has. But not only education, also behaviour of, of children and the fact of the later on in life, the health of the children as well. So if it's good enough for Scotland and good enough for Wales, why are the Tories not thinking it's good enough for the children in this particular country? As far as the, this, the part about the... Uh, universal credit, it's because it's about, as I was mentioned before by uh, Councillor Fox, about 800,000 children whose parents are on uh, universal credit can't get free school meals. Now, this includes secondary school children, I'll be honest, it's not just primary school children. Where there is a, a real need there to, as teachers say, they're recognising some children come to school starving. How can you concentrate on your work during the day? How can you be asked to, to monitor yourself? How can you help move yourself forward in, in life when you've got such a disadvantage against you? And when it comes to the breakfast clubs, yes, the Labour Party has promised to introduce the breakfast clubs, and we know why, because it has a tremendous effect upon the children. I mean, we know that because here in North Tyneside, we saw a significant improvement in children's educational achievement and behaviour as a result of, the filling, of, of, the, of having a filling breakfast from the start of the school day. And what was the argument against that at the time? Oh, well, somebody might get a piece of toast when their father's a, a millionaire. And in fact, the slogan was, let's have teachers not toast. And what did they do when they were elected? First thing they did was stop the free breakfast for all children, not just for the millionaire's child, because they probably couldn't find that one in North Tyneside, but they stopped it for all children. And they didn't increase by a single teacher the provision in North Tyneside. There's one thing that hasn't changed over the years, is that the Tories will always use a cloak of saying, well, somebody rich might get it, so I'm going to take it off all of you. They didn't even mention there that how they would do it. What they have mentioned is the fact that their policies haven't changed in 12, 13 years as far as the Tories are concerned on this council. Chair, a healthy meal for children, free school meal, will allow all children to have the same opportunity to learn and reach their potential irrespective of their family's ability to pay. The effect of good nutrition lasts well into adulthood and research has shown that improved long-term health, educational attainment, leads to many social and financial benefits. So actually the money you put in at the early stages is an investment in society, not a burden on society. And it's about time we help to support the children in North Tyneside. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Pickard. Councillor Gary Bell. Thank you, Chair. 
The argument used by Councillor Vitoli was that it was a social utopia, this motion, but um, we're already in a social utopia, Councillor Vitoli, because your government um, still gives everyone the winter heat allowance, millionaire or pauper. It uh, just gives everyone, I think, £400 this winter for their heating, millionaire or pauper. Everyone receives child benefit, millionaire or pauper. Socialist policies run by a Conservative government. Um, everyone gets a pension, depending on national insurance. Most people receive a pension or pension at credit. Again, another wonderful socialist policy. So um, I don't think the argument stacks up on that one. And our English may not be brilliant, but your maths is terrible. Thank you. Councillor Bell. Councillor Wilson. Yeah, thank you. I wasn't intending to speak, but seeing as we've stumbled into uh, a, uh, a sort of a debate on political econo economy and uh, it's clarified the, uh, the political divide so well, I, I just couldn't resist saying a few words. You know, this is essentially a conversation now about universal public goods. Um, you know, we could include parks, libraries, leisure centres. Councillor Bell's just mentioned child benefit. I think one of the things that I really like about this proposal is the way that it just eliminates the stigma that is present in many schools amongst those kids who are on the free school meals list and those who are not. And I know that from being a school governor and a parent uh, how, how real those pressures are for, for parents and for children and how they're felt. So, uh, yes, I, I'm very much in favour, and I'm, I'm pleased that the, uh, the Conservatives have helped us to clarify this, that uh, we are in favour of universal public goods, not private schools, private health care, private land on which you can't stray and camp your uh, tent in, on Dartmoor anymore, those kind of things. No, we're absolutely for universal public goods, and I'm very, very proud of that. Thank you, Councillor Wilson. Councillor Martin Rankin. Thank you, Chair. The party opposite does not um, seem to have a problem with the corporate socialist utopia that happened during COVID, when obviously billions of pounds were passed to their sponsors, their donors, uh, their peers, their friends, their neighbours, the people who ran the local pub, and they all got dodgy PPE contracts. The other thing that I struggle with is that they also seem to have an issue with targeted help when it comes to feeding children, but they don't seem to have an issue with targeted help uh, when it comes to actually supporting the poor. So last year and the year before, in your budget, you removed the discretionary £1.5 million that we put in to support working age, uh, working age um, council tax support, uh, um, council tax claimants. You removed that money and you gave it to people who were living in houses that are over £500,000. So you don't have an issue with targeted help when it's, when it's feeding children, but you're happy to dish it out when it's to people who live in big houses in the borough. Thank you, Councillor Rankin. Councillor Early. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak before uh, Councillor Chris Johnson issues us with a notice of detention for our <laughs> inferior standard of our homework. Um, I think the problem with all means-tested benefits is, uh, is necessarily a bureaucratic process, it is nece necessarily a slow process, and quite often, it, as others have said, it is in a, in an accurate process. People's lives and their financial situations change rapidly, and we've uh, had a very um, good demonstration of that fact during COVID uh, and, and post-COVID during the cost of living crisis. People are moving in and out of poverty, um, they're, they're, they're moving in and out of qualifications for means-tested benefits, and that necessarily means that there is a trap around uh, benefits levels where a, s a substantial proportion of the population will fail to satisfy those, those um, benefits uh, criteria at any given time, but that does not necessarily mean that they or their families are not struggling financially and would not deserve the benefit of uh, free school, universal free school meals. The, the dangers of those who uh, don't need the benefit um, are minor in comparison to those who would, mi who would miss out and who do miss out under the current system of uh, means-tested uh, benefits for free school meals. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Early. Councillor Scargill? 
Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, as someone who did receive free school meals as a child, I can't vote for this. Uh, and you know what you've done with this motion in making it so overly political to force us to vote against it, and no doubt follow it with false outrage. Um, I don't actually believe most of you who will vote for this really believe that every child should get free school meals. Why not put forward a plan to look at how free school meals are targeted? You should be ashamed that you're taking away meals from those who need it the most to pay for the meals for the wealthiest in society who do not need them. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Matt Mullen. Yeah, I think this is an interesting point here. If we're looking at people who currently get free school meals, it sort of revolves around some of that universal credit element. Now, I've got a friend of mine who has universal credit, but due to his employer's pay cycle, one month he qualifies for universal credit. The next month he doesn't. The following month he applies for universal credit. He gets paid exactly the same amount of money, but because his pay doesn't fall in the same cycle as the government's perceived uh, analysis uh, window, his children are technically eligible for free school meals one month, not the next. Then he has to pay for those and falls back into the, over that dotted line of poverty and backwards and forwards every single month, which uh, I see from a bureaucratic sense makes no sense at all. But surely those are the same children. Why, why in a January are they eligible for free school meals and in a February they're not? Then March again they are, then June they're not. This doesn't make any sense. And that's a bit of, have I stole their food by giving them universal free school meals? If not, I'm just making sure they're fed consistently throughout, rather than being a flip-flop, depending on a government calendar somewhere. Thank you, Councillor McMullen. There doesn't appear anyone else wants to speak. You've already had a go, Councillor Clark. Um, Councillor Davis, would you like to exercise the right of reply? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, first of all, I'd like uh, not to take lessons in leadership challenges from the party opposite. <laughs> they've done. Um, and I'd like to thank the support of all the, my colleagues on this side of the, of the cabinet of the chamber for their supportive um, comments. And um, the really the, the arguments are plain to see that we need to feed children to make sure they achieve. And and you know. Um, I find it quite hypocritical when they say about universal benefits, which well, I supported the triple lock and sort of the Tories, and I'm very pleased that they did, but that's, that's a universal for all pensioners. I'd just like to, to give a couple of scenarios. Um, under um, universal credit, um, core benefits of, uh, for 20 years add up to, um, if for free school meals, add up to 8.9 billion compared to a total of 64.4 billion um, including capital expenditure needed to extend provision of free school meals to all children. This is a return, as I said before, of 1.38 for every pound invested. But if you gave universal uh, free school meals, the core benefits over 20 years is 41.3 billion compared to the total cost of 24.1 billion, including capital expenditure. This is even an even higher return of £1.71 for every pound invested. And I'd like to also quote one of your own MPs, um, MP Robert Halfen, Conservative MP for Harlow, who says feeding children properly brings a cost benefit to the government. It boosts education outcomes, it eases the financial and mental health pressures on millions of parents on low incomes. I, I stood, when I was a child, my, I got free school meals. I had to stand in a queue to go in a separate hut to get my free school meals. And I was bullied because of that. And I, I understand the stigma that's involved. And I think even Mrs Thatcher would be ashamed of some of the comments that's been made across the chamber. And I think, I think you should be supporting this and supporting children of our borough to make sure they achieve. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Davis. We'll now go to the vote. All those in favour of the motion? All those against the motion. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there don't appear to be any be any abstentions, uh, abstentions, but are there? No. Votes for the motion, 48. Votes against, none. We'll now move on to motion for 
Can I invite Councillor Bones to move the motion, please? Thank you, Chair. Um, electric vehicles are one of the best ways that households can reduce their emissions. And across the country, many people are making the swap to EV, with over 30% of all new car sales being battery-powered electric vehicles. However, for many people across North Tyneside, without access to off-street car parking, owning an electric vehicle with the ability to charge it at home is just a pipe dream. This motion seeks to set up an all-party group to look at the potential solutions for this problem, like the gully scheme, which has been set up in Oxford, allowing residents to have charging gullies installed outside their homes, removing trip hazards and helping give more residents access to electric vehicles. I hope all members will support this motion. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Bones. Do you have a seconder for this motion? Thank you, Councillor Bartoli. Um, before I speak to the motion, Chair, I believe there's a, an amendment from Councillor Johnson. Oh, from, sorry, from Councillor Gray. Maybe worth moving to that first. I do have an amendment, but I thought he was going to speak. <laughs> Would you like to show the amendment, please, Paul? Thank I'll tell you. you do need to second the motion first. Mm -hmm. I second the motion. Thank you. Uh, Graham, do you have an amendment? I do have an amendment. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> I think it adds to the motion. The motion will be handed round. Amendment will be handed round. Thank you. Two minutes to read the, the We all had opportunity to read the amendment. In that case, Councillor Graham, would you like to propose? I would amendment? indeed, thank you. Um, I'll just give some background to this. Um, our North Tyneside Zero Emission Vehicles strategy was approved by Cabinet in November 2021. Um, this notes that many card users cover limited mileage during the week and battery technology is improving. Hence, people who do not have a drive or other private off-street parking will often only need to charge their electric vehicle relatively infrequently, for every, usually every four or five days. Action three in the strategy states we will upgrade and expand the existing network of EV charge points in the authority's car parks and premises and rationalise the arrangements for payment for charge point use. The authority will seek to install EV charging points in our main leisure centre car parks and seek to expand our networks at other council sites and seek to install EV charging points in our public car parks. Rapid charge points for public use have been installed in four car parks operated by the authority. An action four states that in areas of terrace streets where houses do not have private off-street parking, if the commercial market does not provide a solution, we will work with commercial operators to seek to introduce hub arrangements and this will prioritise off-street charging homes at car parks or public buildings within the local area. 
will avoid generating additional street clutter or maintenance and management ch challenges and will review opportunities on an ongoing basis. As such, officers are reviewing external funding opportunities for EV provision, which includes the Office of Zero Emission Vehicles on-street residential charge point scheme, or the AUK scheme, a competitive fund beauty contest, which offers up to 60% funding with 40% local contribution. In 23-24, this is expected to be replaced by a new local electric infrastructure or a levy scheme, full details of which are still to be published. In terms of on-street EV charging, a wide variety of products are available, not just the, um, the e-gully scheme. And there are currently no clear market leader or industry standard. Products including street lamp charging, and charging via infrastructure built buried within the roadway. Gully is a product marketed on a commercial basis by Oxford City Council's local authority trading company. And there are 30 trialling um, at the present time, and it relies on users being able to park on the street directly outside their property. And hence, it is, appears to be best suited for streets or housing areas with courtyard parking where this is a possibility. It is described on the provider's website as a secure and seamless cable gully recessed in the footway. However, we would need to be assured that any new EV structure along these li lines did not impact people walking or wheeling. Officers continue to review the available technologies and options proposed by different providers in terms of understanding their implications for the highway network and potential risks to the authority. In short, making the switch from petrol or diesel to an electric vehicle is an important way that households can both reduce their carbon footprint and help to improve air quality, that is, as against walking. However, any form of on-street provision comes with a substantial number of challenges, such as potential maintenance liability, enforcement, availability of a parking space near to the channel, durability given everyday wear and tear, and avoiding creating hazards for people walking and wheeling. The matter could be appropriately pursued through overview and scrutiny or environment subcommittee, but I'm, or a working group as suggested within this motion. And I'm very more than happy to support that, to have a, a working group which would look at technology across the round and not just at one particular technology. So I'm happy to support that, but it would also have to come to the cabinet as the decision-making body. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Graham. Do you have a second of the motion? Amendment? Yeah, thank, thank you, Chair. You. Yeah, um, just as Councillor Graham said, really, um, we're always happy to look at ways we can improve the levels of EV charging right around this borough. And we're also happy to do it on a cross party basis, give that group the remit to go away, look at everything that's out there in the market to see what's actually best for North Tyneside. It might well be that the gully option is best for North Tyneside, but it might not be. So give the group go away and just for governance reasons, it is right that the cabinet would have to make a decision as it would when Councillor Albany was the mayor, and that is the way that we have to do things in this borough because of how it's set up. But I'm um, absolutely happy to support this motion with the amendment. Councillor Johnson. Would anyone like to speak? Councillor Bartoli. Thank you, and uh, thank you to uh, Councillor Johnson and Councillor Graham for the. Uh, Amendment. It is something that we would certainly be willing to support. Um, I think we fully acknowledge that uh, EV charging is uh, challenging, the disparities in the way that we live, um, the ever-changing technologies and the cost implications are undoubtedly going to be a challenge for um, councils across the country. Um, I think my only comment would be that I would hope that something which would seem, whilst not being a silver bullet, a fairly cheap and quick way to um, access charging wouldn't get lost perhaps in a, in a larger scale study which involved um, on street parking, car parking, um, units etc. And I, I would hope that perhaps something like this, a simpler solution, could, could be moved forward without getting lost in the bigger scheme of things. Thank you. Thank you Councillor Bartoli. Does anyone else wish to speak? Councillor Bourne, do you have the right? Thank you, Chair. Uh, we're happy to accept this amendment. Um, the purpose of the motion initially is 
um, to push forward on this important issue. And I think there's a perception from our residents, particularly in wards like mine, where off-street parking is more rare than on-street parking, um, that they are very much locked out of the electric car revolution. Um, and hopefully, by having this group and by looking at the various solutions which Councillor Graham went through in her speech, we can really push Cabinet to move on this within the next 12 months and hopefully give those residents the answers that they're looking for. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bones. We'll now vote on the amendment. All those in favour? That looks unanimous. Are there any dissensions? No? No? Thank you. We still have to vote on the, on the substantive motion, the original motion, as amended. All those in favour? And that's unanimous. Thank you. I did put it on. Can I invite Councillor Scargill to move the motion, please? Thank you, Chair. Uh, this labour on council has let litter and dog mess get to an unacceptable level and brought pride in our area to an all-time low. Not only is it ruining how our area looks, but it also poses huge health and hygiene risks. In New York, parents and teachers are having to clear up litter and dog mess outside of the primary school. Obviously, this isn't okay. But when I've asked for new bins, I'm told we aren't citing new ones, and I've even seen the council remove existing bins without replacing them. When one person litters, it makes other people more likely to litter. Without a plan to clear up litter and dog mess, we can't restore pride in our area. By agreeing this motion tonight, Council would commit to 100 more public bins before the summer, when litter is at its worst, more staff able to give out fines for litter and dog mess, and a refreshed publicity campaign to reduce dog fouling. We all know something needs to be done. I'm asking everyone to back this plan so we can start to clear up our streets. Thank you. Thank you, Council Scargo. Do you have a second of this motion? Uh, yes, Chair. Please, may I speak? You certainly may. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, the motion actually is self-explanatory, isn't it? Uh, litter and dog fouling, they are a really big problem everywhere. Um, but obviously that doesn't excuse us in North Tyneside from trying to do something about it. I'd just like to reinforce two points uh, relative to Councillor Scargill's speech. The first is... Um, New thinking, new ideas. I think that um, we're well aware, I'm well aware, that North Tyneside has some good initiatives, especially those involving going into schools, working with children, involving the community, and litter picking. But there are still many other new initiatives available. Um, and I think these need to be explored. Um, they raise public awareness as well. Something new always raises public awareness. Um, for example, the Dog Trust Charity initiative is called Walk This Way. It saw an impressive 38% decrease in dog fouling. Uh, Keep Britain Tidy, they have an initiative called We're Watching You. It's these illuminated eyes on light lampposts that actually illuminate <coughs> night when most dog fouling takes place. Um, that initiative is called We're Watching You. It involved 17 local authorities, and this saw a, a reduction in 40% in dog fouling. And equally important, no displacement. In other words, it didn't move somewhere else to do that. Um, really, really effective. So a group, a cross-party group, to explore a range of new initiatives and their effectiveness, I think, would be very beneficial. Now, the second element of this is enforcement. Now, enforcement's a difficult thing, actually. Um, on North Tyneside website, there's actually a litany of penalties that can be levelled at offenders with respect to littering and dog fouling. But in North Tyneside last year, there were only 18 FPNs issued re-dog fouling, and that might actually be also falling foul or being on the wrong place on the beach and things like that. Only 18. Um, there were 36 for litter and fly tipping. Now, I accept this is a very difficult element of the problem. Nobody wants to actually come face to face with individuals who you don't know how aggressive they're going to be in one thing or another. Um, but we do need to nail repeat offenders 
They do need to be apprehended. We do need to identify them. Um, and so I do think it's really important that, as Councillor Scargill has said, there's a need to increase the number of staff available to issue fixed penalty notices. It's a very difficult aspect, but it's a very important one. It's no good having, as I say, a list of new penalties unless you're prepared to do the dirty work of actually enforcing it, putting your head above the parapet. So, um, there is another element as well, in fact, which is not raised, but is an important one, and that's taking, making businesses responsible for the areas around their premises. Whether that's, you know, McDonald's at Silverlink, with respect to them, <laughs> and the fish restaurants in Fish Key, at the Fish Key in the Front Street, they should be responsible for the areas that surround them. And I think, you know, a working group could look at that and see if we can't actually say to them, for goodness sake, you know, tidy up that area and make the place look better. So I, I uh, would like to support this very much. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Johnson. I'll now invite members to speak to the motion. Councillor Wallace. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, I'm very pleased to support this motion. Members will recall that um, in years gone by, many of the Conservative group's budget proposals included the provision of extra bins, and dog bins in particular, because it's a huge area of concern right across the borough. Um, alas, Labour members always voted against this. I hope very much that on this occasion, um, the group opposite will support this motion, as it deserves everyone's support in the interests of residents and our visitors uh, in all areas of this borough. Thank you, Thank you. Mr Wallace. Councillor Mazingo. Um, this is so surprising to me. Uh, will the mover of this motion own up to the truth that the uh, that they are the council, North Side Council, would be providing better services if it was not the Tories who cuts who increased the cuts, and um, now they. It, there's a saying in the English culture that says, do as you say. Um, you voted to, do, to have the cuts from the, of the funding. Since 2010, the, the Tory government was um, increasing the cuts, increasing the cuts. So can the mover now agree to say that they want to increase the cuts and now want the services to be improved. How do you expect people to improve the services? Beans are taken off. There are no more people who are doing the beans. There are no more people doing the services. And now you want the services to be improved. How? Thank you, Chair. Um, Councillor Johnson stated that um, most dog fouling occurs at night. So that, does that mean he wants the night shift to go out and stalk people with their dogs and catch them and then do DNA on the dogs to prove how many times it's done its business on the street. It's almost impossible to catch um, dogs in the act. And to be there at the right time, you're talking of having hundreds of staff stalking people with dogs, waiting for them to do their business. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lott. Councillor Graham? Thank you, Chair. The Environmental Protection Act 1990 does not provide a comprehensive definition of litter, but we all know what it is. Dog mess is an emotive issue and one of the most unacceptable types of litter. And research shows that dog fouling is the issue the public are most concerned about. However, nine out of 10 dog owners do clean up after their dog, and the majority of dog owners are responsible. Anyone who fails, up, fails to clean up after their dog can be issued with a fixed penalty notice of up to £100, and littering is also a criminal offence. And anyone caught littering can be issued with a fixed penalty notice of £80. The Environmental Protection Act also places a duty on certain bodies to ensure that their land is, so far as practicable, kept clear of litter and refuse, and local authorities therefore have a legal duty to clear litter on certain areas of public land. In the Council's North Tyneside Plan 2125, a key policy theme of the elected Mayor is to have a green North Tyneside, which includes council environment hit squads, squads that crack down on littering. 
We have a set of environmental maintenance standards which explain our approach to looking after the borough, which includes cleansing standards, litter and dog bins. And reports received by the contact centre relating to dog issues, fly tipping and street cleansing have all reduced in 2022 compared to 2021. Dog issue reports have decreased by 26%, fly tipping decreased by 23% and street cleansing decreased by 17%. And we take a multi-pronged approach towards tackling litter, including street cleaning, litter and dog bin provision, education campaigns and enforcement. Any significant increase to litter bin provision would require additional staff resource for emptying and maintenance. I think you might be surprised to know there is no statutory obligation to provide litter bins. However, as part of our approach to litter management, we have about 2,300 litter and dog waste bins sites across, sited across the borough and aim to empty these bins at a frequency that prevents them from overflowing. The criteria for siting a bin is dependent upon a number of factors, including areas of high footfall, such as town centres, the coast, parks and routes to and from schools. There is no policy of not siting new bins, Councillor Gargill. We do site new bins. I don't know where you've got that from. Consideration is also given to what existing litter dog bin provision is in place, what access is available to empty, enable emptying and maintenance of the bin, and what staff resources are in place to ensure adequate emptying of litter bins. Over the past few years, in response to an increase in high footfall, we have installed over 175 additional litter bins across the borough. Locations include our coastline, Tamworth Front Street, Oxford Street Car Park, North Shields Fish Key, parks and town centres. And during the peak summer period, the emptying of these bins is supported by our additional seasonal team. We have replaced standard 110 litre bins with 240 litre cabinet bins to increase capacity. Our plan is to replace more standard street bins with larger capacity cabinet bins where it's financially viable to do so. Since 2019-2020, the team have issued 421 fixed penalty notices for dog fouling, litter and fly tipping. In October 2022, a member of the public was fined £1,000 for dog fouling and threatening behaviour towards a council officer. And most recently in January, after visits, warning and fixed penalty notice, a North Shields family had been taken to court and fined £1,100 for persistently allowing their dog to get out, roam the streets and foul. We do take action. We recognise the great work carried out by our volunteer groups who also work to help with us, working closely with us to help out litter picking and help to kick, take care of our environment. Street cleansing is a statutory service and schedules are determined in line with the code of practice and within the financial envelope that we have. Additional financial resource will be required for purchase and emptying of bins, and the request for new bin locations will, will continue to be reviewed against our criteria. Additional resource has always been, already been invested to in address littering and dog fouling and our three um, CCTV uh, vans as well. The cost for 100 new litter bins, an associated vehicle, and the staffing resource to support that will be £159,492. I suggest you add this to your budget proposal for 23-24. In addition, the cost Council of a new Graham, environmental in time. enforcement Can you wind up quickly, is £29,700. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Graham. Councillor Thurloway? Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> the fact that the Tories are prioritising bins over the last, over the previous motion about feeding children is just proof that they don't get it. They either don't live in the real world or they just don't care. And I realise our opposition to this motion will probably already be on social media because that's the purpose of the motion. Um, but the fact that they don't believe in a universal in school meals, but they believe in spending Chair, I think we've already covered this. Would you like to take over the chair, Councillor Board? Point of order, Chair. I think we've already covered this. Thank you, Chair. The fact that they don't believe in universal school meals, but they, they believe in spending money on bins, 
sees everything. When I walk my dog, I pick up its poo, and it's a horrible task, but if I can't find a bin, I will take it home with me and I'll put it in my uh, waste bin because I'm a responsible owner. And I think, irresponsible owners, it doesn't matter how many bins you have, they will just not bother because it's, it's, it's just irresponsible. And I think that the fact that the motion um, talks about years of neglect by the Labour Run Council, I'm just wondering why are there nine Tory councillors and 51 Labour councillors? Thank you, Councillor Thurlaby. Councillor Bones? Thank you, Chair. Um, Councillor Lott says it's almost impossible to, ca to catch dog fouling in the Act. I just wanted to assure Councillor Lott that it's even more impossible when the administration aren't trying. Um, Councillor Thurlaway says that we're prioritising this over free school meals, and that's not the case. I mean, this is another example that we focus on the things that we in the Chamber can actually make a difference of, the things that this authority has control over. Instead of pontificating about the government and about things in Westminster, which we have very little say on, we're actually focusing on the issues, like dog mess, which we can control within this council. I'm sure councillors across the chamber are inundated with emails and from residents about litter and dog mess. And it's clear that we need both preventative action, like the proposed 100 new bins, and also punishment in the form of more fines for those who don't follow the rules. If this Labour Council is serious about cleaning up our borough, I can't see how they can possibly vote against this motion. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Bones. Councillor Johnson, Carl. Thank you, Chair. Um, Councillor Bones was right on one point when he said decisions made in Westminster that we can't control. I think exactly the point. We need real devolution and real power so that decisions can be made for the people in this region as opposed to elsewhere. Um, the biggest point Councillor Graham made and the point that means we will have to vote against this motion on this side is the cost to introduce all of the things asked for here. Um, this should be done, the budget's coming up in just less of a month's time now. This should be done in the round with the budget proposals. We, because of the disastrous management of the economy by the Conservative government, the council has had a massive inflation of costs and pressures this year. If councillors want to look at the regular financial management reports that go to cabinet, they will see the record costs of inflation we're facing on the back of disastrous management of the economy by the Tories. So asking us mid-year to stump up what would probably be about £300,000 in total, bearing in mind £150,000 for the 100 bins, um, £30,000 per warden, a campaign um, to tackle litter, and the cost of us of time which costs about £300,000 in total. To stump up this mid-year when we're facing massive pressures is the reason why we can't vote against this. We will absolutely, in the round of our budget, consider all of these that have been put forward because we are always intending to put new bins out there. We always want to tackle dog fouling and we'll always try and tackle fly tipping. We've put over 175 new bins out across this borough in the last few years um, and 54 just in the last year. Um, we're currently waiting for 20 more to be delivered um, and I'm sure Campbell Scott will be delighted to know that one of them is going to New York Primary School. Um, and we've collected a massive 450 tonnages, tons sorry, of fly tipping this year. That's 1,693 cases that responded to fly tipping this year. The additional investment that this Labour Council put into those teams to add those teams to get out there and collect this rubbish. We've had 34 estate cleanups right across this borough, collecting another 139 tonnes of rubbish. So we'll not take any lessons on investment. We, of course, we can always want and we'll try to do more, but we'll not take lessons on trying to clean up this borough when we've made an absolute priority at every step of the way we've tried to. There can be more and we will look at doing more, but to it is financial, would be financial mismanagement of this council to add £300,000 worth of costs in a year. We're already seeing huge cost increases um, due to inflation and the mismanagement by the Tory government chair. Thank you, Councillor Johnson. Councillor Bartoli. I will be supporting the motion tonight. Uh, the problem of litter and dog mess is one that is endemic across the borough, perhaps one that our coastal communities are most blinded by. The problems in Tynemouth are particularly acute because of the large number of people who come to the coast to walk their dogs, but also the large numbers of visitors and tourists who come during the summer months. 
On bank holidays and sunny periods, our bins can fill within minutes at the beach or on Front Street. And the problem is exacerbated by seagulls who pull the rubbish out over overflowing bins. This motion recognises that more needs to be done to keep our area clean and offers some concrete solutions to a real problem. Thank you. Councillor Bartoli, Councillor Rankin. Thank you, Chair. I won't be supporting this motion because it's based on the premise of something which is fundamentally untrue. Um, Councillor Bartoli said before when we talked about the filming of council meetings, um, that filming of meetings and uh, tying it in with cleverly worded Facebook posts and as I understand it, there was a Facebook post which was issued, which is a public statement, which said categorically that North Townsend Council has a no new bins policy, and that has proven tonight to be categorically untrue. I know the area very well that Council Scargill spoke of because I've done, I've done a huge amount of work there in the past. We have had officers right to the retail units there. The larger bin was installed right next to the shops. I've been dealing with the head for a number of years now around litter picking in the area. We have um, the litter picking teams will attend at request of a councillor, as and when there's been issues where there's normally things like pizza boxes there and stuff like that. Things like dog mess, obviously, you know, residents could, on that cut, they could walk around and put it in that bin, which is 15 yards away, but we're still putting in the other bin anyway. So I'm only supporting the motion because unless you, well, obviously, you won't withdraw the statement that you've made to residents, which is that there is a no new bins policy, and that is fundamentally untrue, and so I will not be supporting your motion. Thank you, Councillor Rankin. Councillor Scargill, would you like the right of reply? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I'll just respond to some of those comments. So, uh, about this new new bins policy, this is the email that I had from, uh, from the cleansing team. Cleansing have confirmed that the council are no longer citing new bins, only replacing damaged bins. So, it's not me making this up, this came from the council. And in response to Councillor Menzingwa, uh, you allocate where the council money is spent. Uh, you need to accept what your administration does. It's your choice to only employ one dog warden. Our job is to run this council, not just bash the government. I'm disappointed that the party opposites are not able to back this plan. I can assure you that residents in our borough would have backed it and are desperate to see litter and dog mess sorted out. I hope you can look them in the eye when you explain to them there will be no attempt to stop litter and dog mess across the borough. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Scarborough. We'll now go to the vote. Chair, can I request a name vote, please? This is for all those in favour. If councillors could indicate whether they're for or against or abstaining in relation to this motion. Mm -hmm. Councillor Linda Arkley. Councillor Ken Barry. For. Councillor Lewis Bartoli. For. Councillor Gary Bell. Against. Councillor Linda Bell. Yes. Councillor Liam Bones. For. Councillor Brian Burdis. Against. Councillor Carol Burdis. Councillor Karen Clark. Yes. Councillor Debbie Cox. Yes. Councillor Naomi Craven. Yes. Councillor Julie Crudis. Yes. Councillor Eddie Dog. Yes. Councillor Kath Davis. Yes. Councillor Sarah Day. Yes. Councillor David Drummond. Yes. Councillor Peter Early. Yes. Councillor Lisa Ferrison. Yes. Councillor Michelle Fox. Councillor Sandra Graham. Okay. Councillor John Hunter. Yeah. Councillor Margaret Hall. Yeah. Councillor Tracy Hallway. Yeah. Councillor Val Jameson. Yeah. Councillor Carl Johnson. Yeah. Councillor Hannah Johnson. Yeah. Councillor Christopher Johnston. Yeah. Councillor Joe Kerwin. Yeah. Councillor Frank Lott. Yeah. Councillor Wendy Lott. Councillor Gary Madden. Yes. Councillor Louise Marshall. Yes. Councillor Pam McIntyre. Yes. Councillor Anthony McMullen. Yes. Councillor Jim Montague. Yes. Councillor Josephine Mudzingwa. Yes. Councillor Thomas Mulvenna. Yes. Councillor Martin Murphy. Yes. Councillor Tricia Neera. Councillor Andy Newman. Against. Councillor Pat Oliver. Against. Councillor Rebecca O'Keefe. Councillor John O'Shea. Against. Councillor Erin Parker Leonard. Councillor Norman Percy. Against. 
Councillor Stephen Phillips. Against. Councillor Bruce Pickard. Yes. Councillor Martin Rankin. Against. Dame Norma Redfern, elected mayor. <laughs> Councillor Paul Richardson. He's Sorry, he's not here. Councillor Willie Samuel. <laughs> Councillor Oni Scargill. <laughs> Councillor Jane Shaw. Okay. Councillor Matthew Thurloway. Yes. Councillor Joan Walker. Okay. Councillor Judith Wallace. Four. Councillor George Westwater. Four. Councillor Matt Wilson. Votes for the mo motion nine, votes against the motion 47, abstentions none, the motion is not allowed. One, beg your pardon, one, one abstention. We now move on to motion six. Can I invite Ca Councillor Carl Johnson to move the motion, please? Thank you, Chair. Um, members across this chamber will now see the absolutely disgraceful decision of the Conservative Government not to award level enough funding to War's End and to North Shields. This would have mean real, we presented real strong cases for investment in War's End and in North Shields Fish Key. This, uh, this, this would have secured the historic Cross Tyne Ferry, which has ran continuously um, for over 100 years on the Tyne. Um, this service is now in jeopardy as a direct decision of this Conservative Government. Um, we still will continue to live our ambitious master plan in War's End, but again, this has been slowed and will be slowed down by the Conservative Government. Um, we are absolutely clear what our difference that our investments have made in War's End and North Shields, and we've seen what we can do when the Government do back us. We've seen regeneration of Woody Bay coastline regeneration of North Shields Town Centre. When the Conservative Government put cash and make, let us get on and do things, we are enable, we enable mass and very good regeneration of our borough. The biggest disgrace of this is where the money has been allocated. The, the funding formula was fixed to begin with. Rather than using completely using deprivation as an issue, it added in travel and work time and other things like that to ensure that money would be able to be sent elsewhere in the country rather than those places that need it the most. We have the highest levels of child poverty in the country, in this region, and yet we are not deemed worthy enough. In fact, in North Tyneside, we're not even deemed worthy enough of being in Priority 1. We are sat in a Priority 2 area, which means no matter how good our bid is, we will not be able to access funds because we are got one hand tied behind our back by the Conservative Government to stop us getting this funding. We are tight. In the motion it says 80%. Um, the first round was 75% somewhere in the middle in this round. Um, we are literally, our max score is below what other people have, uh, what other people are able to get. So a council that scores 82%. If we scored 95%, they would get the money before us because our score is capped at 80%. Our bids were, great, were very good, made sense, lots of support from around the region and in conversations with dealer ministers. Um, we really need the funding form, we need the allocation change. The level of funds has been an absolute disaster um, from start to finish. Money going to the wrong areas at the wrong times. Um, often used to fund conservative marginal seats in the northwest and the southeast. Um, we need the review of the allocation criteria of the level of funds because without that, North Tyneside will not get a single successful level of bid in the future if we continue to have one hand tied behind our back. And we really need the government to commit to put us in the priority one category ahead of the third round of level of funding, which will be coming. Chair, the whole thing is absolutely stinks. It's an absolute disgrace 
the way the Conservative government went on, not just for North Tyneside, but right around this region. They've abandoned their Conservative peers in County Durham by not giving County Durham a single penny. You are a priority one area. They've not given South Tyneside a single penny. You are a priority one area. They've not given Sunderland any money. They are a priority one area. Um, I guess there's too many Labour MPs and Labour councils in those areas for the government to care. Um, Chair, we really need urgent change in this. I'd urge every member of the Chamber to back the motion. Thank you, Councillor Johnson. Councillor Hannah Johnson, do you wish to second the motion? Yeah, I'll second it and I'll reserve the right to speak. Councillor Bartoli? Yeah, I'd like to move an amendment, please. chance to read the amendment. <coughs> Councillor Bartoli, you're moving the amendment. Do you have a seconder? Uh, I have a second, Chair. Thank you. And now I invite people to speak to the amendment. If, Councillor Bartoli, after you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. The members on this side of the House were equally disappointed um, as the members on that side by the decision of the government. We wanted this funding just as much as you did. Um, I can speak personally for my ward that the moving of the ferry would have moved it into Tynemouth and it would have tied up the uh, embankment walkway into the Howard Street and um, eventually into uh, Northumberland Square and it would have been a real boon for the area. Um, and we fully support uh, Councillor Johnson's um, motion in as much as the asks that it makes and we would like to make this a cross-party motion and we think it would carry more weight as a cross-party motion but unfortunately we cannot um, accept the first paragraphs which has highly politicised the motion. Sorry. Um, if I could just give a, a small example of what I mean by politicisation of the motion the first paragraph refers to the Tories have let our area down while giving 19 million to Rishi Sunak's leafy Richmond constituency. I know Councillor Johnson, I'm sure, is, is fully aware, but this bid was by Richmond's uh, District Council, which is a Lib Dem uh, independent coalition. The money went to Catrick Garrison, which is the biggest military base in Western Europe. The funding was to, uh, for a new town square play areas and better accessibility to the town centre as part of the enlargement for the town to house more of our troops. So it's easy to pretend that this was just a, a political move to give 19 million to wealthy people in Rishi's uh, seat, but the truth is, is slightly different. So we would make the offer to the... Um, to the group opposite, that if we can remove the politics from this motion, then we would be more than happy to uh, comply with the asks that Councillor Johnson has suggested, and we, we would support it on that basis. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bartoli. Councillor Johnson? Chair, this is a fundamentally political issue, right? And removing the politics from a political motion would not make any sense. If the Conservatives don't feel they can criticise their government, they should take a leaf out of Andy Street's book who today has absolutely criticised the government. Um, writing his frustration. Fundamentally, this episode is just another example of why Whitehall's big in, bidding and begging bowl culture is broken. And the sooner we decentralise power and move to proper fiscal decisions, the better. The centralised system will restore servants, making local decisions is flawed. And I cannot understand why the level of fund money was not devolved to local decision making. He goes on to then criticise the level of fund bid and the process. Um, this is absolutely right, the government are levied criticism in this issue. 
Um, Councillor Bartone is absolutely right about the Catwick Garrison proposal. The town's for an earlier process also awarded money to Richmond, and that was, certainly wasn't to Catwick Garrison. Garrison was another town in Richmond um, which received money. So I don't think we are going to move to politics from this. The politics should absolutely stay in there because they are a fundamental part of this motion. Um, it, it could have been we chose Richard Street at the Leafy Richmond constituency. It could have been anywhere else in the country where this has happened. Um, Chair, the politics are right to stay, and we all want, we will ensure they are kept in, kept in chair. So we vote against the amendment, but we still would urge Conservatives to um, follow Andy Street's lead and stand up to your government rather than being the government representative of North Tyneside, be North Tyneside's representative of the government chair. Thank you, Councillor Johnson. Councillor Rankin. Thank you, Chair. I think it's one of those things where I'm, I'm slightly confused by why you want the, the politics taken out of the motion when you've just asked us to vote for Motion 5, which said, Little and Dog Messing North Tyneside has got to an unacceptable level after years of neglect by North Tyneside Labour Run Council. You've just asked us to vote for a motion criticising ourselves. We're asking you to vote for a motion which criticises your government. And this has been done in plain sight. Everyone has seen the film of Rishi Sunak bragging to Conservative Party members to get their votes to become leader, saying that this is what he did and this is what he was going to do. So we're being disenfranchised from the possibility of getting funds to improve our residents' lives. And he's doing it in plain and open sight. And I think it's one of those things that we should all be standing together. We should be sending a rocket to the government. It shouldn't matter which party we're from tonight, because this was absolute game changers for two of our major towns and the residents that live there and the people who want to go and visit. So I think it should stay as strong as this, because you, know, you should have been making your own representations today to your head office, saying what an absolute disgrace it was. It's a national story. It's all over BBC. There are, there are literally, there are countless examples, not just Time Out, sorry, not just North Shields and, and not just Wars End. So you have the opportunity tonight to actually represent the residents in this chamber rather than representing your government. Thank you, Councillor Rankin. Councillor Bowles. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Councillor Johnson mentioned Andy Street, and Andy Street has had a transformational impact on the West Midlands, much of which is thanks to private sector investment, which unfortunately is something that this mayor and indeed the mayor of the North of Tyne seem to be allergic to. Um, I think from this, uh, I agree entirely with Councillor Bartoli that we um, are happy to support the asks of this motion, but to the idea that we should be pitting um, somewhere where our troops are based against um, areas within our, own, within our own borough is frankly disgusting. And again, you know, it, it doesn't take two minutes, does it, for the Labour Party to revert back to bashing our troops in Catrick Garrison. Point um, Chair, that has absolutely nothing to do with this. That is an absolutely disgraceful comment and you should have thought immediately. Thank you, Councillor Rankin. You've taken, the word, uh, the, you've taken the words out of my mouth. That is a disgraceful comment. So, sorry, Chair, I'm standing by that comment. That, the, the, the motion clearly states that, for some reason, Catrick Garrison, which is the biggest uh, army base in Western Europe, is so... Point of order, Chair. Point sorry, of order, Chair. Sorry, Chair, I'm speaking. Point of order, Chair. Who shouted that? Chair, yeah, it doesn't mention it doesn't mention Catholic Garrison in there. It, men it mentions Richmond. The, the specific. Councillor Bell. Councillor Bell. I wish the Bones hasn't been here very long, but on all party political basis, we've every motion that's come to this council for the Conservatives or Labour has been always supported fully towards supporting our troops. May not be served. So I would withdraw that. Thank you. Chair, the motion specifically refers to the £19, 19 million pound bid which was successful for Catrick Garrison. Now, for some reason, this motion seems to imply that that is less worthy than the bids for North Shields and for Wall's End. And personally, I, don't, I think our troops deserve better than that. Thank you, Chair. I might need to take a breath after that one. Um, look, f first off, before going to what I, I wasn't going to say anything on this motion, I thought it would speak for itself, but I'm going to go into it now. I, I can't accept the amendment, and I can't accept the amendment for one reason. The, amend the motion as amended would seem to 
try and portray the fact that we've got a level playing field. And what Councillor Johnson's clearly shown is that we don't have a, clear, uh, a, a, a level playing field. So we do need to be political on this motion. We can't escape from the fact that we don't have a level playing field. Now, Councillor Bones, it may surprise you to know that I was in the army. I've, ne I've never talked about it before. And it may even surprise you to know that I was in the infantry and I served in Catrick Garrison. Actually, that was the last place I was posted. Now, the service accommodation in Catrick has been rated as unfit for human habitation. Was it, well, not just Catrick, many service accommodation. And Michael Grove was actually on this morning saying that he had real concerns over the state of service accommodation. That is, service accommodation that's been managed by the Conservative Party for the past 12 years. So if anybody's bashing our troops, I don't think it's the Labour Party. I'd also go into the fact that it was your party who sacked 25,000 soldiers after serving in two war zones. So again, I don't think you can be lecturing us on how you treat our service personnel. I'll also remind the Conservative group opposite that there were members on the Conservative group who refused to back motions that this group had brought forward supporting our troops. Commonwealth veterans being one of them. That's documented and we know it. Look, my biggest problem with this is when we look at levelling up, it's supposed to be a fair system in which places that need the money are given it. So we bring Richmond up because it doesn't seem fair that the, con the, con the Conservative Prime Minister's area is getting all this money and we're being rejected. But it goes a little bit deeper than this. I, I completely reject the Oliver Twist style funding formula that the Conservatives have presented us. This begging bowl mentality where you have to go to you know, the government with a begging bowl saying, please sir, I want some more. You've ripped the budgets from all local authorities over the past 12 years and then give us a begging bowl and then expect us to be grateful or expect us to accept excuses when you say, no, you're not, accept you're not entitled to do your 11 up funds. It's not fair and I would I expect everybody in this chamber, regardless of their political party, to turn on to the government and tell them it's not fair. Thank you, Councillor Newman. Councillor Thurlby? Um, Chair, I think I've forgotten what I was going to say after um, sort of Liam Bones, Councillor Bones, um, threw a hand grenade, um, really, in the debate. Um, it's quite difficult to follow Councillor Newman, um, you know, who is, the, who is the expert on this. Um, but I, I think Councillor Bones should um, withdraw his comments considering I can see at least four veterans on this side. Thank you, Councillor Wilson. Thank you. I do think it is beyond ironic that the levelling up agenda and these levelling up funds are, are based on formulas in the Treasury um, that ensure that bids are not equated to one another equally. I mean, it's, it's staggering that it can be called the levelling up fund and that you can have some people ranked in one uh, grade, uh, grade two, and a whole bunch of other people in, in tier one. Uh, ultimately, and I've looked at the whole list today, downloaded the spreadsheet, it seems to me that the number one criteria is funding shiny projects that provide photo opportunities for ministers. Um, I do believe that after today's announcements, the whole idea of levelling up is probably so discredited that I think we'll see the end of it. I really do think that uh, this is probably going to be the shifting of this agenda now. We'll see some new buzz phrase coming out of Downing Street in the weeks ahead. Thank you, Councillor Wilson. Councillor Hannah Johnson. Thank you, Councillor Oliver. I, yeah, I wanted to second this motion because I, I just can't believe that the Tories of us were not willing to immediately back people in North Tyneside. The fact that we are not getting the money to back areas like North Shields and Walls End in our area, not only would this money just improve the general look of the area, but it would also improve plans for adult education, the provision that we provide in those areas. It would give a higher quality of jobs as well, not just a higher quality of jobs in North Tyneside, but also with the ferry, for example, and increase network, transport networks within North Shields and Tuckwell's End. It would increase people's ability to move within the borough and access high quality jobs in our area. And thirdly, just the sheer impact on culture and leisure at a time when we all know now what it feels like to not be able to access those sort of things having gone through lockdowns. We know what it's like 
We know the impact that people can have on people's mental health and their well-being. The fact that we are not back in an area like Tegadurum as well is just incredible. The Tories are not wanting to make this political because it is political. You know, we can have arguments about semantics of wording and things like that, but it is clear, as Councillor Wilson said, that these funds, these bids, have gone to areas where there are Conservatives MPs, Conservative Ministers. It is political. That is exactly why we have made the motion political as well. And the fact that you are not willing to back people in North Tyneside is a not a disgrace. Thank you, Councillor Johnson. Does anyone else wish to speak? Councillor? Councillor? Yeah, thank you, Chair. I, it's just a shame that the motion, um, obviously Councillor Patoli spoke about his, his amendment. Uh, which he wants to su support, uh, well, everybody in the, the chamber uh, wants to support the fact that we haven't got the money. And we put the, this motion in, and we can't, we, we didn't get together beforehand, and maybe come together with a motion which is set, set with everybody, because at the end of the day, we all live in the borough, we all want the best for the borough, don't we? And we don't want, you know, there's £20 million here which would have really changed <coughs> the borough, uh, give us aspiration. And um, the government's not just let the Labour Party down, it's let the Conservative Party down. So it is a pity we couldn't have come to some sort of formal arrangement where we could have sent a letter, I've got asked the, uh, our team to ask, <laughs> to send a letter to the government as requested with all parties which had supported it. And it's a bit of a shame, but um, if, on, on where it is now, I'd have to report against it. Thank you, Councillor Bell. Councillor Samuels? Just very briefly, um, I, I, I listened to this, the suggestion we should take the politics out of the issue. And yet, contradicting yourselves yet again, we've got an urgent question coming up from Councillor Scargo, who, se who seeks to put the blame on the bid team um, exactly. So again, you're contradicting yourselves. You either want to take the politics out of things or you don't. Thank you, Councillor Samuels. Councillor Johnson, would you like to exercise the right of reply? <laughs> Councillor Samuel has just stolen part of it there, but that's exactly what I was about to say. Um, but uh, Councillor Samuel is absolutely right. Councillor Scargill, in his urgent question, um, is using politics. He's trying to blame our officers and this Labour and Council for not getting the money. Rather than everybody knows why we didn't get this money, the Conservative government want to send it to Tory marginal seats to try and save their. They're desperate hanging on, 20 points behind the Labour Party's lives. Chair, um, I'm delighted for Cara Garrison that they got this money, but I'm here to represent the people of North Shields and Walls End. They are the residents of this borough that, with that they elect us to represent. And I will continue to push the case to ensure North Shields, Walls End and every other town in this borough gets the best so we cannot possibly support this motion. It is right to leave the politics in. And I was wondering what bizarre defence the Conservative Party were going to use to try and defend this, because it is really indefensible. But to try and accuse the Labour Party of not wanting troops to get money is simply an absolute disgrace, Chair. Um, certainly be voting against this motion. Thank you, Amendment. We're now going to go to the vote on the amendment. Those in favour of the amendment? <laughs> Those against the amendment. Oh. Okay. Those in favour of the amendment, nine. Those against, 42. No abstentions. 47. 47. Why is it 47? <laughs> right, we'll now go back to the debate on the original motion. Does anyone wish to speak, or shall we go straight to the vote on the original motion? All those in favour of the original motion? Chair, can I name vote, please, Chair? I second that, Chair. All those in favour? No. 
So, so this is a vote for or against the motion or an abstention. Councillor Linda Arkley. Councillor Ken Barry. Councillor Lewis Bartoli. Councillor Gary Bell. Councillor Linda Bell. Councillor Liam Bones. Councillor Brian Burdis. Councillor Carol Burdis. Councillor Karen Clark. Councillor Debbie Cox. Councillor Naomi Craven. Councillor Julie Crudis. Councillor Eddie Dark. Councillor Kath Davis. Councillor Sarah Day. Councillor David Drummond. Councillor Peter Early. Councillor Lisa Ferrison. Councillor Michelle Fox. Councillor Sandra Graham. Councillor Margaret Hall. Councillor Tracy Hallway. Councillor John Hunter. Councillor Val Jameson. Councillor Carl Johnson. Councillor Hannah Johnson. Councillor Christopher, Christopher Johnston. Councillor Joe Kerwin. Councillor Frank Lott. Councillor Wendy Lott. Councillor Gary Madden. Councillor Louise Marshall. Councillor Pamela McIntyre. Councillor Anthony McMullen. Councillor Jim Montague. Councillor Josephine Mudzingwa. Councillor Thomas Mulvenna. Councillor Martin Murphy. Councillor Trisha Nera. Councillor Andy Newman. Councillor Pat Oliver. Councillor Rebecca O'Keefe. Councillor John O'Shea. Councillor Erin Parker Leonard. Councillor Parker Leonard had to leave and go home. Councillor Norman Percy. Councillor Stephen Phillips. Councillor Bruce Pickard. Councillor Martin Rankin. Dame Norma Redfern, elected mayor. Councillor Willie Samuel. Councillor Ollie Scargill. Councillor Jane Shaw. Councillor Matthew Thurlway. Councillor Joan Walker. Councillor Judith Wallace. Councillor George Westwater. And Councillor Matt Wilson. Votes for the motion, 47. Votes against, nil and nine abstentions. Now, we now move on to item six. Can I ask the elected mayor to move the report, please? Thank you, Chairman. The council has requested to approve a timetable of meeting for 2033 to 2024 and to agree those dates of council meeting. During 2023 and 2024, at which questions will be taken from members of the public. The timetable has been drawn up using similar principles upon which the current year's timetable is based, as set out in section 1.5.2 of this report, and is based upon the commencement times that were agreed for the current municipal year. The timetable also includes dates for member briefings and members' development. There is a proposal to review the timing of the, pal the planning committee in, asso in association with political group leaders to ensure that the timing of planning committee meetings is optimised. The dates for planning committee in the attached schedule should therefore be considered indicative at the current time. It is also... Yeah. Is someone's telephone buzzing? Because it's becoming very annoying. It is also proposed that, as for the current year, three council meetings be designated for public questions, i.e. the meetings to be held on the 20th of July 2023, the 23rd of November 2023, and the 18th of January 2024. I would like to move the recommendations as set out in paragraph 1.2 of this report. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mayor Edford. Do you have a seconder? 
Councillor Johnson. Second of the right to speak, Chair. Are there any questions? Councillor Johnson. We'll go straight to the vote. Then those in favour. And those against. The motion is passed unanimously. We now move on to item seven, which is chair's announcements. I don't have any announcements to make at the moment. I would just urge you all, if you possibly can, to attend the Holocaust Memorial next Friday, which is at 10 o'clock in the council chamber. Can I ask Mayor Redfern if she has any announcements? No. Thank you. Item nine. Two valid questions have been received from members of the council for this meeting. Councillor Bowles, would you, do, would you like to ask your question or have it taken as read? I'll ask it, thank you, Chair. In December 2021, councillors were given advice that it was safe to resume face-to-face -face ward surgeries. From experience, we all know just how effective these sessions can be at hearing the views of the residents that we are all here to serve. Despite this guidance, the Mayor has yet to hold a single Mayor Listens event since the pandemic. When will the Mayor resume these, cru these crucial events? Thank you for your question, Councillor Bones. I'm delighted to be able to engage with many of our residents each month in very many, very different ways, not just through the listening events. Residents can make direct contact with me via the phone, email, letter, or by talking to me when I'm out and about at various locations across the borough. I'm sure you will agree that the one thing that the pandemic has allowed us all to do is to look at ways we deliver our services and make adjustments that better meet the needs of our residents. That has included how best to engage with our residents. When I first started the uh, listening events, it was after, it was about the, listening to our residents in, when I was campaigning for the first uh, uh, mayoral elections, and the residents said to me at that point, uh, you only come when it's election time. You never listen to what I say, right? And some of you are really uh, unapproachable. So I decided when I was first elected as the mayor to have listening events, right? And a lot of the listening events eventually, initially rather, attracted high numbers. The most recent at Clellingworth Centre on the 11th of January 2020 had only 11, res 11 residents. Prior to this event at the Brecon Centre in North Shields on the 9th of November, uh, I only spoke to six residents. And, strangely enough, three of them had the same concern. This compares to over 1,400 inquiries made directly to me in 2020. 1,140 inquiries to me in 2021. And 1,300 inquiries in 2022. As members will be aware, I attend many, many different events during the day which provide an excellent way for hundreds of residents to speak to me directly. This includes the recent Spirit of the North Tyneside celebration event, the very successful Tyneside Together event in summer last year, and of course the State of the Area event which you all attended. I also meet regularly with different organisations, uh, the Business Forum, many community groups, right across the borough. Now I hope this assures Councillor Bones that our residents can and do contact me about any matter that considers important to them in this borough. And I have found over the last few years the best way to make contact with your residents and meet them face to face is to do street surgeries. Do a street surgery and you, dis you actually discuss what's concerning them where they are, and I get lots of queries in which I can deal with very quickly. So of course, Councillor Bones will keep this under review, uh, 
But as far as I'm concerned, it's only two, it's only two years ago since I was elected for the third time with an increased majority first time round. And I'm sure, I'm sure if the residents weren't happy with me, they would let me know. So I have no, no desire not to go out there and meet people. In fact, I'm out there all the time and I welcome. In fact, sometimes, Councillor Bones, I'm, I'm seen to have a surgery when I'm in the shopping centre, sometimes in the hairdressers, sometimes on North Shields High Street. So what I've proved is, yes, I listen. Yes, I am approachable and being pretty successful. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor Edward. Councillor Bones, would you like to ask a supplementary question? Yes, thank you, Chair. So, just to be clear, the Mayor isn't planning on resuming her listens events. They are instead a campaign tool. Instead, she speaks to select invited guests at events. Dame Bradfern doesn't hold surgeries. Sorry, Chair, I get a minute to ask a question. Dame Redfern doesn't hold surgeries. Instead, she hides from the public. Dame Redfern won't answer questions from the public and other councillors in this chamber. Dame Redfern won't answer questions from the public and Councillor other councillors. Councillor Bones, you can stop right there because you need to ask her questions. Chair, I'm trying to ask a question. I'm just being shouted down by the members opposite. Dame Redfern won't even answer questions from... Pub, from, from I'm get, Chair, I'm getting to the question. Dame Redfern won't even answer questions from the public and other councillors in this chamber. Instead, she hides behind members of her cabinet. My question is, Chair, my question is, Chair, what is the Mayor afraid of? Well, all I can say to you, right, if I was such a terrible Mayor, I wouldn't have been elected three times with increased majorities. Yeah. You wouldn't be having nine chairs and we have 51. Come on, Councillor Jones, you uh, won't use your intelligence. <laughs> um, we now have an urgent question. Councillor Scargill, would you like to ask your question? I have it taken as read. I'll ask it. Uh, the allocation of levelling up fund grants has seen millions of investment to Northumberland, to our north, uh, the North East combined authority to our south, and even Gateshead Labour Run Council has received almost £20 million to fund regeneration. Does the Mayor accept that, based on these facts, funding has not been allocated on party political grounds and instead realise that other authorities have submitted higher quality bids for this funding? Councillor Johnson, I believe you're answering this one. No, I'm not. I'm answering this one. No, Councillor Carter. Councillor Scargill, would you like to ask a supplementary question? Thank you. Um, well, I'm sure uh, the Mayor would have put a, a lot more thought into the bid if it were for Whitley Bay. Um, when will the Mayor and her administration accept responsibility for their own failures rather than blaming everyone else around them? Thank you. I don't think some of us heard what you said there, Councillor Scarborough. Would you repeat it and get a little bit closer to the microphone? Sorry. I said I'm sure the Council would have put a lot more thought into the bid if it were for Whitley Bay. Is that a question? Chair, the beat, point of order, Chair. That actually isn't a question, Councillor Scarborough. No, the, the question was after, sorry. When will the Mayor and her administration accept responsibility for their own failures rather than blaming everyone else around them? I've never ever blamed anything, anyone else for anything I've been responsible for, Councillor Scargill. You know that. No, Councillor Hunt, the meeting's over. That concludes tonight's meeting. Thank you all for your attendance.